Welcome. Welcome. Добро пожаловать! Welcome! 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 Welcome. 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 On this Rejoice Sunday to First United Methodist Church. This morning we gather in our homes to worship, yet we still gather in unity. To open our time of worship with song, we will sing with spirit that all are welcome to our community of faith. With the psalmist, we declare that it is good when kindred live together in unity. The scriptures on this day invite us to connect in spite of our differences and encourage an overcoming of our fear that keeps us apart. These lessons point us toward a God who is welcoming and desires a community of kindred that is inclusive rather than exclusive. We gather together to hear the good news. All are welcome. We are a reconciling church, striving to move toward reconciling relationships with all, affirming those who are marginalized for any reason. We welcome all. As we begin our new program year, let us set our hearts, our minds, and our spirits on creating a unity that is blessed by God. Welcome, kindred. Welcome. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray for the coming of your kingdom, and you call us to be an inclusive church that exemplifies the kingdom of God. As you forgave sinners and taught us never to cast the first stone, so we would move toward reconciling relationships with all, naming and speaking our truth, and working for peace with justice. As you taught that among the blessed are the poor, the meek, the persecuted, so we would affirm those who are marginalized for their identity, for their culture, for their color, for their class, for their orientation, for any reason. As you welcome the weary, the heavy laden, the little children, so we would welcome all with open hearts, open minds, and open doors. Be with us and lead us in our journey of faith and help us to say all, all are welcome, welcome in this place. place.
How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordains his blessings, life forevermore. teaching found in this passage of the book of Romans emphasizes that the church should be a place of welcome, where unity is found not in particular practices of piety, but in the fact that we belong to the Lord. God has welcomed us, Paul says. We too should welcome those whose piety differs from our own. Let us hear these words of wisdom and encouragement found in the book of Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord since they give thanks to God. 
while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For, this, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Good morning. Welcome to A Time for the Child Within Us All. We're so happy to have all of the children here with us today. I'm Miss Julia, and this is my daughter Carolyn and my daughter Penelope Hello. and our dog Neptune, and this is our house. So mm -hmm. welcome to our house from your house. The scripture we just read reminds me of a game, and it's a game that has been played for hundreds of years and all around the world. Oftentimes, families will play it. They'll put tape on the ground or will play it for fun at school, or maybe you've played it in gym class, but it's called tug of war, and you put a line on the ground, and then you take a rope, and you stand on one side or the other and there's two teams and you pull until a team wins and i once played the most epic game of tug of war ever in college we played tug of war over this very large river and we dug pits in the dirt and it was the freshman class versus the sophomore class and we sat in these pits and tugged the war or tugged the rope until one class won over the other class and it was so cool. I lost the year that I did it but it was pretty cool and it's a good game to play at a family reunion or maybe some other event you've gotten to play that game. Playing tug of war reminds me what it is like when two people argue though too. Sometimes it can be a fun game, but sometimes it can be like an argument where each person thinks that they're right and they try to get the other person to come over to their side and agree with them. Arguments often happen when we are angry or upset. Maybe someone did something hurtful. The argument goes, back and forth, back and forth, just like a tug of war rope. And cruel things sometimes can be said. The Bible verse that we just heard from the Old Testament says that it's asking us, why do we judge each other? And then it's reminding us that all of us are accountable to God we are responsible for ourselves to honor God. When you are angry, it may be a good time to remember that we are all accountable to God. And instead of fretting about the other person, we should make good choices for our own selves with our own behavior. Choices that are made in love and peace, and that honor God. Let's have a repeat after me prayer now. So I invite you to please fold your hands <laughs> and bow your heads and close your eyes and repeat each line after me. Loving God, loving God, help us be responsible, help us be responsible, and honor you, and honor you, with loving and peaceful with loving and peaceful choices choices amen amen have a great week we'll see you next week bye, bye.
Rejoice Sunday. If it were any other year, we would find ourselves gathering in the church building. It would be bustling with the energy of fall, of new beginnings, and buzzing with the greeting of friends and family who may not have seen each other through the stretch of the summer. Rejoice Sunday is launch time. Just like so many other institutions and programs in the fall, churches also have a Sunday when they begin again. As a society, we often talk about January being a new year, and it is, but fall has its own special and unique buzz of a beginning. Any other year, we would be sending our children off for their first day of school. We'd be packing our college kids up and trying to figure out how to place so many belongings into a small shared space. Our job may take a new rhythm with fall and certainly the cool evenings and the donning of an extra layer tells us that a new season is upon us. Even the trees will soon blaze with the glories of fall. And then slowly they will let go of their leaves, exposing their bare branches. It is still Rejoice Sunday. We will celebrate that we are the church, even when we celebrate it in our own homes rather than the building. Being the church, still allows us to connect to our own life of faith, to others, to God. It is good to be accepted into a community of faith. We are welcomed even with our own warts and bumps, our past failures, regrets, lost opportunities, and times that we have not embraced life fully and abundantly. We are welcomed when we are joyful, and filled with the beauty of living, loving, and being peacemakers. We are blessed to know that we belong to a community of faith that believes we are kindred. We are an ever hopeful community that believes building, reconciling relationships is our calling and worthy of our dedication. First United Methodist Church of Kalamazoo invites all persons to join us on our journey of faith. Jesus Christ calls us to be an inclusive church that exemplifies the kingdom of God. We strive to move toward reconciling relationships with all, affirming those who are marginalized for any reason, including sexual orientation, or gender identity. We welcome all with open hearts, open minds, open doors. It is still Rejoice Sunday. This day and every day, we are given an opportunity to say yes to life in Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide and escort us through life. We are given opportunities to create possibilities, to create new ways of living and flourishing in this world. Yet even in the midst of the blessedness of knowing that we belong to God, belong to one another, and believe in creating a bigger table for all, this Rejoice Sunday is different. We all yearn to be together. We long to pack up our lunch bag for our children. And even though we'd cry when we left them in their dorm rooms, we want to send our college-aged children to move into their independence. We're still working from home. And we are not creating community and singing jubilantly within the church building. We must name it. Several of this Several of us, as this health crisis stretches out, are sinking or at least meddling with mild, middling, or even deep depression. 
We experience anxiety and often wake up in the middle of the night thinking, worrying, and yearning for the before. It is important to name where we are, how we feel, what is happening in our spirit, because when we name it, then we can begin to be empowered and know just what and who we are wrestling with. Just like Jacob, who wrestled with God in the deep of the night, naming may be elusive, and we more than likely, even hopefully, will come out on the other side different persons who are stronger, more capable, and eager for life because we have wrestled with our own darkness, our doubts, and our despair. My shiro, Brene Brown, says that right now, in the middle of this season of launch, that is fall, we are in the mucky middle. It's as if we've buckled ourselves into uh, the ride Space Mountain. The unsettling and disarming effect of this ride is that we're buckled in and it's dark. We can't see what's up ahead and we keep getting jerked around. We climb and we climb, trying to get to a different place. And then it feels like free fall with major curves thrown in that leave us feeling like we've just been given whiplash. Into this mucky middle of coronavirus, into this launch season that feels an awful lot like same old, same old, stay home. We are given this song that oozes with hopefulness, even in the face of perceived disappointments and disillusionments. Psalm 133 is a song of ascents. It's a song for going up to a high place. For the Jewish people of ancient times, that high place was the temple in the city of Jerusalem. It was a place, a certain location, much like our own church that we have associated with going to as an act of worship itself. Jerusalem crowns the hill. One literally goes up to Jerusalem and the temple stood on the mount. The Jewish people with joy sang Psalm 133 because God had promised to meet them when they came together for worship. The Psalm is rooted to place, much like we have been rooted to a place at 212 South Park Street. On this Rejoice Sunday in particular, but really at any time to fully celebrate our faith, we must hear the promises of blessedness that God gives that are not at all rooted to place. We must hear how this psalm imparts blessing and life to God's people that goes far beyond place and into themes that are deeply embedded and proclaimed by the oneness of faith. From Psalm 133, abundance and unity flows, and it's a promise to people in all places and at all times. The most pronounced theme of Psalm 133 is unity. Verse one proclaims, how very good and pleasant is it when kindred live together in unity. The New Interpreter's Bible informs us that the word kindred does not mean blood relatives, but a people joined together by God's grace. Kin or kindred is not a word that we use frequently in Southwest Michigan occasionally, but not every day as you might find in other parts of our country. We all missed our summer service trip this summer, which would have taken us to pockets of our society that use this word with frequency. Living in Georgia and North Carolina and traveling to the Appalachia Mountains every summer, it is not unusual to hear someone ask, are you all kin? 
it's very common for someone to identify and then be able to place someone based upon the making of connections to who their kin is and how they might know them. Kinship carries the idea of a relationship that's shared. I have sisters, a brother, aunts, uncles, and cousins in which there is a common bond, a relationship, an affinity. The understanding of kin can be stretched to include not just those who are related by blood, but to those that you have claimed as your kin, claimed as your family, professed as your near and dear, your beloved. We are kin as a community of faith. We have a spiritual affinity. We call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ. In the many years that I worked in residential treatment centers with children and youth as a chaplain, the notion of kin regularly became this sticky notion. Many youth would go through a time of identity crisis when they realized that their blood kin was not capable of taking care of them. They would feel rejected, abandoned, and wonder how they were going to make it through this world without someone who would claim them as their own. They would question in a heart-wrenching manner, who is my kin? Who are my people? It then became our job to connect them to give them a tether that they could hold on to as they made their way through life. It could be foster parents, adoptive parents, extended family, or an independent living program that would be the anchor on the end of the tether. We would frequently have conversations about chosen family and that sometimes the claiming of family is that much more powerful than just being born into a family because it is just that a choice you get to choose who will be by your side you get to choose who you will trust with your well-being you choose to love someone who will reciprocate your love and value the love that you have to share psalm 133 it's not a very long psalm, but it is tall on ambition. It calls all people to worship God. It begins at a very particular summit or place, but it does not stay in that place. Before, we were united by 212 South Park Street. But our ambitious faith calls our faith to cascade beyond this particular place, just like the temple of Jerusalem. It all starts with a few people that might even be identified as insiders or members, but it flows outward in a blessing for many. It flows beyond a building, into the streets, into the homes of all, and pours into the hearts of all who will answer to the call of love and hope. We are called to go with the flow. The psalm speaks of flowing down the mountain and outward to the valleys and to the plains. On this Rejoice Sunday, we may hear the flow that may have begun associated with a particular place. But in this time of the mucky middle, it cannot get stuck there. We must flow with faith into our community, believing that we can do all the good we can do, by all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places and times that we can, to all the people we can, as long as we can. Liquid shows us how to flow. And the psalm mentions two liquids, oil and dew. Oil is mentioned first, and it's precious, fragrant, refreshing, and it is used to consecrate. 
The psalm references the consecration of Aaron, part of the Israel's priestly tribe. This oil is proclaimed as precious, but there is no hint of stinginess in the pouring of oil, the anointing with oil. The pour is so lavish that it runs down the head of the priest into his beard, down his collar, and most likely trickles down his back. Unity that comes from a gathered people, but flows with lavishness to all people, is sweet, pleasant, and pleasing to God. Our reconciling love is not meant to be stingy. It is meant to flow with a sweetness that can find its source only in the love of God. Oil being connected to the love of God, it's, that's not just contained to just the Psalm 133. We find oil being used for guests at dinner parties, provided by a generous host. We remember the woman who anointed Jesus and the women who gathered on Easter morning to anoint Jesus' body with oils and spices. The oil was believed to be a sign of mourning, and yet it became an announcement of a resurrected life and love that could not be contained within a tomb, but had to flow into all the world and all the hearts. For those who follow this flow of faith, hope, and love, oil becomes a symbol of worship, feasting, and a celebration of unity. This unity is so powerful, it takes us beyond death into resurrection. The welcome of God is so vast and the unity is so deep that it brings us to a community of saints that crosses time distance, and we find oneness forever in Christ. When we sing one of our classic hymns, Morning Has Broken, we sing this, Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dew fall on the first grass, praise for the sweetness of the wet garden sprung in completeness where his feet pass. Dew is the second liquid that is mentioned in Psalm 133, the dew of Hermon. Professor Nancy Koester of Osberg College writes this, Mount Hermon is far to the north of Jerusalem. Mount Hermon rises above the upper Jordan Valley. It had its share of heavy rainfall and snow. The melting snow or dew flowed down into the valley. It fed the Jordan River and reached as far as the oasis of Jericho. In arid country where the rain is scarce and the rivers dry up, the land and the people depend on water that comes from a distant source. It is the scarcity of water in the dry lands which makes Mount Hermon dews so precious. We worship a God who is abundant in life and love. This God calls us to be in unity that flows like oil and dew. It's not contained. It's not for only some and not for others. It is for all. We are anointed in a love that God, that calls us to be welcomed into a kindred that is not bounded. We are to bless others with a welcome that builds a bigger table that flows down the mountain into the streets, finds a home in hearts so that we may become one family, kindred. In the midst of this mucky meadow, in the grief we name because a virus limits our lives together, we thirst for the love of Christ. We desire an anointing that will bring us to a sacred place of belonging. Just when we despair that life is a scarce commodity that is measured out from one disappointment to the next, we hear the call of Psalm 133 to go with the flow of abundance that is lavish to all people. 
the Apostle Paul asserts to the community of faithful found in Rome, we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. The love of God found in the healing, teaching, resurrected Christ is not reserved for a chosen few. It is not scarce with never enough to go around. Grace flows down to us, through us, and makes us one in faith. This psalm offers to us who are stuck and maybe suffering in the mucky middle words of hope, images of grace and a promise of kinship. We belong, all belong. We really are in this together. It's true. There's a tiny microscopic organism called coronavirus that is keeping us from gathering together physically. It is Rejoice Sunday, like we have never seen before. But this virus is teaching us that we need to be united for a common cause. We need to take care of one another and we need to be concerned with the well-being of those across the oceans and in our own community. We are in this together because coronavirus is teaching us that what impacts one really can impact the whole. We are living in a divided time that often focuses on our differences. We fragment ourselves by politics, race, social class, even our spirituality. Unity seems like a faraway concept and its neighbors love and grace seem to be frequent outcasts as well. Together, let's reshape the narrative and go with the flow. Let us have eyes that see one another as kindred, certainly not enemies. Let us live into abundance and deny the language of scarcity that desires to divide us and make us believe that there is not enough for all. The teachings are ancient. The call of God has not changed. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Let us discover and rediscover the blessedness of unity and find that we are kindred seeking kindred. On this Rejoice Sunday, we dedicate ourselves to a lavish love that claims us as kin and leads us into the realm of God's kingdom. As we follow the anointed one, we hear our calling and receive anointing to work for the coming of God's kingdom. Pray with me. Spirit of the mighty, gentle one, come upon us and anoint us all. We see the oppressed. We name them and hold them close. Make our lives good news for them. We see the brokenhearted. We name them and hold them close. Give us gentle grace to bind up their hearts. We see the imprisoned. We name them and hold them close. Give us true words and deeds to release them. We see the ruined cities. We name them and hold them close. Make us a part of their building up. Spirit of God, be upon each and all. We see our own ruins, our chains. Hold us close and set us free that we may be your good news for others. Amen. On this Rejoice Sunday, we celebrate our anointing. Now, if we were all gathered together, we would ask for you to come forward. 
and each would receive the blessing of anointing from one of the pastors or another member of the community of faith. This Sunday, I want you to find some oil in your own house. Now, it doesn't have to be special. I want you to go and get some canola oil or olive or avocado oil from your kitchen or go and get a little lotion or hand cream from your bathroom or bedroom. And if you have none of that, go and get a cup of water, like the dew of Hermon. Or simply use your imagination and feel that God or someone is anointing you in love. Now I know it's just as easy to sit in your chair and remain there and let this part of worship unfold. But in the midst of this messy middle, we need to be anointed with hope, love, and grace. Come and receive and give this anointing to another or yourself so that you may work for and be God's kingdom enfolded within God's kinship. Let us be anointed for one another and for God. physically together in worship, we write our prayers on these cards, prayer after prayer after prayer, and they just come pouring into the church. You all write your vulnerabilities on these cards, your joys, your concerns. You put your heart on these cards and the, and the pastors gather around them and pray for them. And so as I, as I pray for the community today, I, I invite you to um, imagine words on paper, pen, ink, pencil on paper, reflecting the desires and the pains and the joys and the concerns and the celebrations of our collective hearts being lifted up to God. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy God, you are the God who is in the sanctuary and in the streets. You are the God who is in the garden and in the hospital. You are the God who is all of the places we find ourselves. And we know, O oh God, that you listen to everything that we speak and all that remains on our hearts. We know, God, that you are ever more ready to listen than we are to speak. And so when we are too frightened or too ashamed or too timid or too shy to speak the prayers that are on our hearts, you still hear them. You lean in closely. You bend down low to the places we are. You lend us your ear and invite us to speak. And we know this is true. We know this is true because you have proven yourself throughout human history that every time those who were hurting and oppressed and sick and suffering cried out for help, you responded. We know this in the testimony of those saints who have come before us 
We know this as our own lives bear testimony to this truth. So God who listens, we know that you listen now and we pray that you would work out all things for your glory and for the good of those you love, your children, us. We pray for those who are grieving at the loss of loved ones, that a light of hope from the eternity that they now know might shine upon those who remain and give them hope. We pray for justice in a world that is crying out for healing. We pray for the prophets who speak the truth with their lips and those who march putting their very bodies on the line. We pray for nurses and doctors and all who work in the hospitals caring for those who are sick in all forms. We pray for this world and this nation as we continue to navigate a global pandemic, praying for a cure, for a vaccination, and in the meanwhile, for patience, for understanding, for light in the midst of the wilderness to know how to be in this new unfamiliar way. We pray for teachers and students and parents as we all enter into this new school year that is unlike any other. We pray for this nation as we face a new election here. That in just a few months, we will know who the next president of this nation is. And we pray that there is access to voting for all people and that all people would have the freedom to vote their conscience and that your will would be done in this country and that we know and that we would all know that at the end of the day, you, you are the one who is holding us and all things together. May we put ultimately put our trust in you, O oh God. And finally, God, we pray that you would shape and form us so that our lives might look like the life of your son, Jesus. Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together. Hey church, God is always calling us to respond to God's love by giving of ourselves fully through our witness, through our presence, through our tithes, through our offerings. Now, every month when we have coffee house worship, we have a special offering 
change for the world where we throw our loose change into a globe and then we send that change uh, around the world to places that are doing justice and mission to support those works. Since we can't be together, since we can't physically throw change in a globe together, we're going to invite you this week to make a different kind of offering that brings some change to the world, to our local communities. Kind of like this right here. So from my neighborhood to your neighborhood, from the end of my driveway to the end of your driveway, we invite you this week to bring some change to your local communities just by sending messages of hope and love and justice. Pick up some sidewalk chalk, write messages of God's love and justice out on the edge of your driveway, out on the road where you live, out on the sidewalk. Write messages of love and then go for a walk. Go for a prayer walk. Walk around your neighborhood and say a prayer that God's love and justice and mercy would be known in your neighborhood. And let's spread that love all around the community. We also invite you in this time to prayerfully consider how you can financially give to God's work in the world through this local church. As always, there are several ways that you can give to the work of God through this church. You can text to give. Just text a dollar amount to the number that is below. And the first time you do this, there'll be just a little bit of setup involved. But after that, it's pretty simple. You can also go onto our church website and sign up to be a sustainable uh, giver every week or month or make one-time gifts, however you choose to set that up. And you can mail checks into the church. But remember, we are blessed to be a blessing. God has given God's self fully to us and invites us to give of ourselves to God's work in the world. So let us give with joyful hearts on this Rejoice Sunday.
Well, church, I want to just take a moment to talk about our shared life together uh, before we begin our Wednesday evening prayer service out here at the church. Now, of course, by the time you see this video, by the time you worship with us, uh, Wednesday night will be four days gone. But I do want to just tell you and share with you that, that we're out here every Wednesday night uh, as long as the weather and the sun allow at 7 o'clock. It's a simple time for prayer, for being together in a way that is socially distanced and safe with our masks on. So join us this coming Wednesday at 7 for prayer and fellowship for just about 30 minutes on the front lawn. Now there's a few other ways that we can share our lives together that are coming up. Uh, after worship, you're invited to join our new congregational book study as we read a bigger table together so hopefully you can find the link to that uh, book study in your around the corner email again that meets right after uh, right after worship today there was another group that met with the family foundations group right before worship began earlier this morning and both of those groups will meet for eight weeks solid so you are invited to join either one of those groups reading uh, A Bigger Table by John Pavlovitz. Now later in October, Lisa Batten is also going to offer a one-time uh, read-through, uh, just analysis of that book. So if you, if you can't make it every week for eight weeks, you can join her uh, for just a couple of hours to talk about the whole book and some more details and, uh, about that will be coming up um, in terms of what night that is and what time that is. Uh, but either way, we hope you can participate in our congregational study. Uh, tonight, we have our first youth tribe of the fall. So all youth 7th through uh, 12th grade, you can join me uh, on Zoom at 6 o'clock. If you didn't get that link and you think that you are, are part of uh, youth tribe or you know you're part of youth tribe and you're like, how do I connect to this? Please just shoot me an email, mweiler at umc-kzo.org and I will uh, pay attention to that today and, and get you connected. Uh, the other thing we want to point you to is uh, the connect form. So you can find a link to our connect form right underneath this video if you're watching live. So please uh, fill out that form. This is how we know who is a part of a, or who is part of our worship and who is connecting and who's uh, likewise not able to connect with us. You can say hi, uh, drop us a note on that connect form. And certainly if you want a pastor or one of the staff to reach out with you and be in conversation or prayer with you, indicate so and we will get in touch with you. It's also a place where you can leave your prayer request uh, and those are prayers that we look at and pray for every week. Uh, so our lives are shared together in Christian community. While we can't physically be together in the church, uh, there are a number of ways that we can be together through prayer, through study, on Zoom, some safe ways in person. But friends, let's stay connected. Let's stay connected. It's more important now than any other time. That's all we've got right now. Let's continue in worship.
Now, let us go forth with this blessing. We are called to experience God's love, celebrate God's love, and share God's love. Love is the spirit of this church. May the songs we sing celebrate this love. May the lives we lead embody this spirit. May you all go forth in peace. Thank you.